in a world where jobs are how most people make money. One man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manassero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manassero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, type in Old Dogs, spelled D A W G S find our podcast and subscribe. Well, I am uh, real stoked about today's show. Uh, we have a, a great guest on, um, someone who has uh, written a book that uh, I really have found invaluable as a passive investor. And I'm talking about Brian Burke. Now, Brian is president and CEO of Praxis Capital Inc., a vertically integrated real estate private equity investment firm. Brian has acquired over $800 million worth of real estate over a 30-year career, including over 4,000 multifamily units and more than 700 single-family homes with the assistance of proprietary software that he wrote himself. Brian has subdivided land, built homes, and constructed self-storage, but really prefers to reposition existing multifamily properties. Brian is the author of The Hands-Off Investor, an investor's guide to investing in passive real estate syndications, and is a frequent public speaker at real estate conferences and events nationwide. Well, Brian, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. It's great to be here, Bill. Thanks for having me. Oh man, this is I, I'm I'm stoked about this. This is great. Um, uh, I I think uh, you know your book. Uh, although I haven't completely finished it, I uh, have just uh, immersed myself in it and uh, found just a lot of great stuff in there. So I'm I'm excited. Before we start, uh, yeah, I'd love for you just to kind of just give us your background, where you're from, and so forth, and uh, you know, so our, our audience here can uh, get a better idea who you are. I grew up in Southern California and then uh, moved to Northern California, and I'm still here up in the wine country north of San Francisco. Started investing in real estate just after I got out of high school when I basically knew nothing about real estate, had no money to invest, didn't know anyone that knew anything about real estate, didn't know anybody that could rub more than two nickels together, and figured I'm fully equipped to go out and conquer the real estate world. So, <laughs> so I started my real estate investment journey with my very first uh, uh, rental house that I bought. I didn't even own my own home yet. And, uh, and then I just, I never looked back. It was a, it was a horrible experience. And I thought, well, I'm a glutton for punishment. Let me do this again. And so, uh, you know, 700 houses later and, you know, several thousand apartments units later, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that was a fast forward there. Definitely. <laughs> Gosh. Just a little bit. Uh, well, that's great. Well, um, you, uh, your firm, maybe, you know, you could define for those of our audience that might not understand you know, specifically what a vertically integrated real estate private equity investment firm is and what it does. That's a heck of a mouthful, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I had to practice that before the uh, we went on the air, you know. <laughs> yeah, you got you to do that one three times fast. If you can do that, you get the prize. But uh, basically, the you know, a vertically integrated firm that's a, a vertically integrated real estate firm is one who has all of the disciplines of real estate 
uh, investment under you know one umbrella. So uh, to that, it means that we acquire real estate, we you know get it financed, and then we have our own management company. So we manage the asset. Uh, we do our own uh, renovation work, and then ultimately we sell the property. So uh, a firm that does what we do that isn't vertically integrated generally just means that they hire third property, third party property management companies to manage the assets once they have them in their portfolio versus vertically integrated, uh, which means that we manage it ourselves. And the private equity part just means that's describes how we fund real estate investments. Uh, we raise money from high net worth individuals, family offices, and institutional investors to acquire our multifamily properties. So we, we pool that money together and, and that's how we make our purchases. When you break it all down, that big long name does make a little bit of sense, but it is quite a mouthful. Great explanation. Yeah, that that's right on. Uh, it's interesting that your firm, you know, is really the one that is acquiring properties. You're you know, you're, you're investing in those properties. Um, but you write a book about, um, how to passively invest. And I thought that that was, you know, really interesting. And, and you address that in your book, of course, too, but maybe you can, you know, give our listeners an idea of, you know, if you're, you know, not necessarily the guy that's the LP or the, uh, you know, out there in projects and in investing yourself in syndications, um, why would you write a book on? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a question I asked myself when I came up with the idea of writing this book. Um, you know, there were a couple of reasons why I wrote it. One was because a friend of mine had lost her entire life savings investing in a passive real estate syndication. And uh, you know, I didn't want to see that happen to anyone else. And another reason was in talking with a lot of investors that had reached out to our firm to invest with us, you know, they were asking all sorts of questions. Uh, and I, I realized that oftentimes they were asking all the wrong questions and, and leaving the right questions out, uh, or they were completely approaching uh, how to safeguard their investment in the wrong way. And uh, I didn't. I found that there was really no other source of educational content for people who are going to invest passively to learn how this business works, and so that's how I came up with the idea to write the book. But then I kind of was thinking, well, you know, I'm really on the other side of the fence, right? I'm the one offering the passive syndications. I'm not the one that's the active investor. Shouldn't an active investor be writing the book? I considered actually co-authoring it with a few people I know that actively passively invest. And then after thinking about it for a while, I realized, you know, I really was the perfect person to write this book because I know all the inside information, right? And it's, you know, I know what's going on behind the scenes and can warn people about what to watch out for and, and that sort of stuff. Whereas a passive investor may not know those things and, and wouldn't be able to convey uh, that message across to the readers. So, you know, I, I handled, I, I tried to uh, write this from the investor's point of view, but yet with all the insider knowledge of uh, someone that's been in the syndication business for two decades. Right. I, I, I think that that's a real good point. Um, I, I think there are a lot of things that, that kind of go on behind the scenes and, uh, you know, behind the PPMs and, and so forth and the, and, you know, wording of things and, uh, you know, presentations, whether it's a, you know, webinar or, um, you know, some other, you know, marketing materials that come through, there is a, a different message sometimes than, than what, what reality is <laughs> in, in, you know, in, in many of these, uh, uh, deals and, and where people really need to know what to look for and how to look for it. And I, and I think that's what I really appreciate about the book is it tells you how to just sort of go to that next layer and under that next layer and so forth. And, um, um, in, in, putting the the book together uh, you know obviously there was some point you and you when you gave your your background there yourself i mean you obviously you started with a rental property that and went through traditional means and financing it and so forth but there had to be a point where you actually did syndicate for the first time so you became sort of that first time syndicator do you remember where that where that was and i'm sure it was quite a while ago but uh, where you decided i needed to syndicate 
Yeah, I had no choice but to syndicate. I mean, the first property that I bought, I was able to buy that with zero dollars down by getting a loan for the property and then convincing the seller to carry back the down payment as a second uh, unrecorded second note. So throughout my early investment career, I always was trying to figure out how I could invest in real estate, even though I didn't have any of my own money. And so when I wanted to expand my business and, and do more than just trying to find, you know, the occasional random seller that was willing to, you know, help me out, uh, I had to raise money. It was the only way I was going to be able to grow. And at the time, I was working in law enforcement, which was kind of like a nights and weekends job <laughs> because I was working swing shift and had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. So I kind of had the whole business week to do my real estate business. And I was doing it, you know, with a combination of uh, private money loans and lines of credit and credit cards. I mean, you name it. I figured out every method of creative finance to be active in the real estate investment game. And, you know, I had a few dozen deals under my belt by this point and finally decided that my uh, my night job was getting in the way of my real estate uh, day job pursuits. And uh, it was time to hang up the uh, hang up the job. So I uh, put in my two weeks notice uh, with the city and told them I was uh, I was leaving. And I told all the guys at the police station, I said, guys, I'm put in my notice. I said, I'm going to do this real estate investing thing full time. And by the way, I rented out the room at the community center. I'm going to talk about what I'm doing. If you guys want to know what I'm up to, come come over there and I'll tell you all about it. And I filled up that room with uh, all my coworkers. I gave a presentation about real estate investing. And I said, if anybody wants to join me, you can contribute as low as $5,000 and I'll split the profits with you 50-50 on a pro rata basis. And so- wow. By the end of that meeting, I had a half a million dollars in uh, funding commitments from 28 cops carrying guns, and uh, <laughs> you know I, I knew that uh, I was now responsible for their uh, their life savings, so to speak. And I, if I screwed it up, my life was at stake. So that was my entrance into the syndication world, and uh, you know I, I always knew I, I could never lose any of these guys' money, or I was a dead man because. You know, they didn't just have a gun. They knew how to use it and how to get away with it. And uh, so so I knew I could never screw it up. So I never lost that. Uh, I never lost that approach to this business is that first step, don't lose anybody's money. Second step, don't lose anybody's money. So uh, it served me well for 20 something years. Man, talk about incentive there to do it right. <laughs> yeah, that's about as much incentive as you can get. Right. If they talk about alignment of interest or skin in the game. Yeah. Come, come meet me 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, you know, that was the old school way, you know, of, of starting out too. You know, you'd rent a little room or, or you know, invite them to a, some sort of a restaurant or whatever and do a presentation and, uh, you know, maybe even overhead projectors and things like that. It was. It was. Remember yeah. the little clear slides? That yes. You'd, 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 like, you'd, you'd print them out on a printer and then you'd set them on the, the lighted uh, projector and it would cast them onto the screen. That was exactly what this meeting was. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, now we're, you know, we're all zoomed out and, uh, you know, plugged in. People don't hardly ever see each other in person. But, uh, but uh, yeah, those were the good old days, right? <laughs> it, it was. If I if I had the tools today that I have today, back then, uh, I probably would have climbed the ladder a little bit faster. Uh, well, that's that's great story. Great story. Well, um, you know, gosh, just, there's uh, a you know a lot of a lot of questions that I have. I, I think um, you know I, some of the the first things is that you know we're taking a look at our our audience and uh that you know these are folks that are 50 years of age and older um some are already retired some are approaching retirement and they're looking at you know real estate investing as a means for them to either grow their nest egg or maybe it's uh maybe they you know, want to be an active investor and they you know they're being retired, they're looking for something to do and they might want to buy rental properties or what have you. So they're looking at, you know, real estate from many different perspectives. But for those that are more interested in a passive approach, um, this, I, I think that, you know, just, just trying to understand what's involved with the syndication uh, sometimes can be a little bit, uh, 
intimidating for people, you know, just, uh, oh gosh, you know, how do I know that this guy that is the sponsor of this deal is, is the, is the real deal? And can I trust him? Um, how do I know that, you know, that the things that he's presenting to me are true? Um, you know, I mean, cause, cause you know, they're dealing with their, you know, their life savings here, just, just like those cops, you know? And so, you know, what, what, what would you say to those folks, you know, first off, you know, that maybe haven't gone there yet we've got others that are you know more savvy in it but uh, those that that are you know considering investing in a syndication um that uh, you know that they should know off uh, just off the cuff well investing in real estate always comes with uncertainties right there's risk and uncertainty in any investment endeavor and real estate is no different uh, investing in real estate directly comes with its own set of risks investing in a passive syndication is essentially the same as investing in real estate directly. It carries all those same risks. The only difference is there's one added risk and that added risk is the sponsor themselves. So when you're investing in a passive syndication, essentially what you're doing is you're outsourcing your real estate investment pursuits. So instead of you spending your time going out and looking for a house to buy and getting financing and managing tenants and, and doing all that stuff, instead you're just basically finding uh, an investment sponsor, a company, the private equity firm or a real estate sponsor that will go out and do all of that stuff for you. Now they get some fees and they get a split of the profits and that sort of stuff, but you don't have to do, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But there's a, a misnomer with the term passive investing in that people think that it's entirely passive. And, and while the real estate portion of it really is, the initial selection process is anything but passive. Uh, you know, this is a time when you're looking to invest with a firm. You need to be really active in uh, doing due diligence on them and understanding who they are and how they think and how they operate and how they're capitalized and all those things so that you can make sure that they're going to be a good steward of your hard-earned life savings. And you know, for the for the old dogs out there there's no time left to make all your money back. So this is a critical decision because you can't just throw you know, caution to the wind and then somebody loses it and you have all this time to build it all back up again. Your risk tolerance has to match uh, you know, the stage of your life that you're in. And it's, uh, it, you know, that's the most important thing is mitigating your risk and making the right decisions. Right, great. Yeah, that, uh, um, I, th I think that, one of the things that uh, you know that I've heard from from numerous people in the past is, well, you know, if I, if I do it myself, you know, if I take that same hundred thousand and I buy a half a million dollar property, um, you know, I I know I, if I do everything myself that I can control, you know, what's going on a little bit better. There definitely is a lot more involved. It no longer becomes passive. It it. it you know, and even though a lot of people say rental properties are passive, they're anything but <laughs> from from those of us that have gone through that that process. Um, so you know, it, from, you know, from that standpoint, um, you know, what would you know, what would you say to, to you know, somebody, you know, maybe considering that the other side there? Well, you know, you might also be inclined to think you can do your own minor surgery as well. I mean, oftentimes <laughs> it's, you know, things may seem easy, but are more complex than they might be. So just having control doesn't reduce your risk. Uh, because if you don't know what you're doing, being fully in control and making the making big mistakes in investing in real estate isn't any better uh, for you. So control isn't the issue. Risk mitigation is the issue. And you know, when you're when you're outsourcing your investments uh, to uh, a company that does this for a living uh, and are professionals, they're going to make fewer mistakes if you're making the right selections, because they're going to have made all of those mistakes before you came along. You know, I've al I've already been through the rookie mistake phase of my investment career, and I'm not learning on the backs of you know uh, private investors. I.e., if you're just considering getting into real estate investing, you're gonna make your rookie mistake. Uh, it's gonna be on the backs of your own capital. So, uh, you know, the control doesn't doesn't equal uh, risk mitigation or safety. Got it. And um, 
If somebody is, is considering syndication, what would you say would be sort of the first steps that they, they have to take? And, and you did you know preface earlier that it isn't totally passive. You know, you do have to do your due diligence. And what, what, what would you say would be sort of the first steps that somebody should initiate before even investing a cent in a syndication? Well, it's a common question I get is how do I find a deal to invest in? And this kind of goes along with your question here is that, you know, that's asking the entirely wrong question. You shouldn't be looking for a deal to invest in. Instead, what you should be looking for is you should be looking for investment firms to invest with. And it it may sound like minor semantics, but there's a major difference here. Uh, The first step in your syndication journey is to find the right investment sponsors. Uh, that's really where the journey begins and it's almost kind of where the journey ends. I mean, you wanna find the right firms to work with, you wanna do due diligence of, on those firms and learn about their experience, their track record, uh, you know, what they're investing in, what their investment philosophy is and, and all of those things. And then once you've found a few firms to invest with, then all you have to do is sit back and wait because the, eventually those firms are going to present deals to you. And if you if you did a good job selecting good firms, they'll be presenting you with good deals. So, uh, you know, you still want to look at the prospectuses that they send. You want to analyze the financials and determine whether or not what they are sending you really is good. Uh, but that's that's how you invest in syndications. You wait for those good sponsors to to bring you deals. Great point. Great point. And and when you start getting into the deal analysis, um, how deep do you recommend people go? And um, you know, because you know, when you really dig behind some of these deals, there's I mean, there's there's a lot of variables, and there's the market knowledge you need. You need to understand the you know the the, the actual property itself and the dynamics there, um, without you know being able to have the being part of the inspection and, and the other aspects of that property. Um, so how, how deep do you, do you recommend that, that they go? I recommend you go pretty deep. And I also recommend that maybe you don't invest in the first deal that a sponsor sends you. Uh, so when, when you're analyzing what information they're putting in front of you on a specific deal, you want to look at First, the financials uh, and, you know, the financial projections Do the financial projections they're putting in front of you make sense. Uh, how do they compare to the property's historical performance and where they differ? Uh, you know, is the business plan to get, uh, you know, to the projection make sense? You'll want to look at the real estate, the market, uh, you know, obviously you don't have a market knowledge in markets all across the country. but you should be picking a sponsor that has market knowledge and market where they're investing and you can lean on that experience and ask for information if they aren't providing it, which they usually will, but you can even ask for third party uh, data to support their thesis. Uh, you know, good sponsors will have market reports that they can send you that will point to what's going on in the market and you know why they believe in that market. So I, I recommend going, taking a pretty deep dive. That's why I think I spent probably about a third of the hands-off investor just talking about line item by line item, financial statements for income real estate and you know what they mean and what they should look like and what's a normal and what's not normal. And uh, it, yeah, I, I did that because it's real important to understand all that stuff thoroughly. And most people that are investing in real estate, especially people who are thinking about investing just like in rental houses, don't know about you know, all the nuances of an income properties financial statement. But, you know, I try to do my best to, you know, provide some great examples and show people the way. Yeah. And I think you wrote it in a way, too, that you, you don't have to be a CPA to understand it. I, I think you you brought it to the level of, you know, most of us and in, in terms of uh, being able to look at the financials without just having your your eyes glaze over <laughs> and so um which is which is great looking at you know just uh, the experience that you've had with investors and and i'm sure and it sounds like you've you just there's hundreds and hundreds of people that you've dealt with over the years uh, maybe thousands and um what what's a sort of a common mistake that investors make just off the cuff from your experience 
A couple. One is just failing to uh, do good due diligence on investment sponsors and the deals that they put in front of them. Uh, the third, the second is failing to properly diversify and and use diversification as a defense mechanism. You know, they'll go all in on something, and you know, so there's there's kind of both extremes where you have some people that are like putting all of their free cash into one deal. That's a bad move. And then I know another guy. He's like. Yeah, I just invest twenty five thousand in every deal that someone puts in front of me because I don't really care, and uh, you know, eventually it all kind of washes its way out. And uh, you know, so I've seen extremes on both ends, and I think a good approach is down the middle where you're investing a meaningful amount in each deal, but you're spreading it across different deals, different sponsors, different geographies, different property types. Uh, you know, the idea is, you know, especially for especially for the old dogs out there, that diversification is going to help protect your your principal. It, it's it's not going to uh, give you the highest return, but that's not what this is about. This is about getting a good return, a good risk adjusted return. Uh, it's not about trying to maximize uh, every cent that you can. Good point. Um, just uh, taking a step back, when you talk about finding the right company or the right sponsor, um, what if what if somebody doesn't know any? I mean, they're coming in totally blind. They don't have any any you know uh, exposure to um, these companies or sponsors. So how would how would they go about trying to trying to find somebody before they can start moving in that vetting process? Yeah, everybody starts there. You know, this is a kind of a secretive business. I mean, the way it's by design due to securities laws, generally speaking, most real estate sponsors don't advertise because they're limited against advertising. Uh, and if they can advertise, they're restricted only to proven accredited investors. So oftentimes people, when they're first considering making a passive investment, they don't even know where to start. And really, the to find... Uh, real estate sponsors is takes a little bit of work. So one is, you know, do what you're doing right now. You're listening to this podcast. Listen to this podcast. Listen to other podcasts. You'll find that there's people on those podcasts that are in the syn real estate syndication business, uh, and you'll get to, you kind of get a free peek behind the curtain. Uh, you'll you'll see a little bit about what they're about and how they think just by listening to the podcast, which gives you a little bit of a head start. You're not just cold calling a firm out of the blue and don't know a thing about them. So that's one really good way. Another is you can attend real estate investment conferences and network with the people at real estate investment conferences. Uh, BP Con is coming up in October. It's biggerpockets.com's uh, convention. There's like 2,500 people there. There's a lot of real estate uh, private equity sponsors there. You can just Google real estate private equity and you know and start looking at company websites and you know make inquiries with companies that um, that look like uh, you might want to work with. Uh, you can you can even call uh, real estate brokers in you know cities where you're interested in investing and ask them you know who's who's your most active buyers. Uh, almost sure that those active buyers are uh, syndication sponsor firms. Uh, so that's a good way to get leads. Uh, sometimes you don't have to call them. There's some major brokerage houses. I think I've seen Marks and Millichap or a couple other major brokerage houses, you know, post data on their websites that talk about, you know, transactions in a city. They might say, you know, Phoenix Metro, you know, top transactions, and they'll list who the buyers were. Or, uh, oh, wow. You might. You might even find it in um, news articles like on globestreet.com and stuff like that. You'll see announcements that come out, you know, so-and-so group bought such and such property. And then you can research so-and-so group and learn a little bit more about them. So it does take a little bit of digging and uh, fishing around. But, you know, you'll start to you'll start to find them. And as you network, you'll find more. I think one of the things that also is really appealing um, about real estate in general is the uh, it's just the leverage that you get um, with um, with real estate. Now, I know from my own experience, having you know done that, starting with single family homes and working up to apartments and so forth, that that um, you know the the leverage aspect is what's really appealing to it. But if somebody is is going to stay exclusively passive you know how how do, how do they leverage 
Well, you know, there's there's it's a different kind of leverage. I mean, oftentimes when you're thinking about leverage in the context of real estate, you're thinking about, um, you know, how do I buy this house with somebody else's money? Right. So I'm going to put you you came up with an example earlier in the show. You said I've got one hundred thousand dollars. They can buy a five hundred thousand dollar property. Uh, you know, that's leverage because they're getting four hundred thousand from a lender. And so, you know, they're getting a five hundred thousand dollar property for one hundred thousand dollars. Well, investing in a syndication is kind of the same thing, except in this case, instead of owning a 500,000, 100% of a $500,000 property, you might own 10% of a $5 million property or 1% of a $50 million property. You own the same real estate either way when you think about it. Uh, but with the larger real estate, you're leveraging economy of scale. You know, you get larger property you know, for the same money and that operates more efficiently than smaller property. So you're automatically getting some leverage there. The syndications are also using bank financing. So, you know, they're, they're not paying cash for that $50 million property. They're borrowing, you know, $30 million from Freddie Mac and then they're putting in $20 million of equity. I mean, they're basically doing the same thing and getting the same uh, kind of leverage that you'd be getting if you went out and bought real estate yourself. You're also getting leverage from a few other things. You know, you're leveraging the sponsor's time, uh, you know, because they will be out finding real estate and financing it and doing all that stuff. So you don't have to do that. You're financing their team. Uh, you know, they may have a whole team of people that are out looking for properties. And if you were looking for properties, it's just you. Uh, they'll have a network and contacts and relationships that especially in the context of larger commercial real estate is extraordinarily important. Uh, brokers really only want to sell to people they know. And so, uh, you know, the tickets to the game are a little harder to get as the properties get larger and you get to leverage uh, those relationships and you get to leverage the sponsors, cash reserves and balance sheet. You don't have to put up your balance sheet to get a loan like you would if you went and bought your own house. Now you've got a loan on your credit report and, you know, you've got, um, contingent liabilities and that sort of thing. Whereas in a syndication, that debt is taken on by the syndication sponsor. They're signing on the uh, guarantees. You're not. And so, you know, you get to leverage that as well. So there's, there's a lot of aspects of leverage to passive investing that you don't even really think about in the context of real estate investing when you're just investing on a small scale individually. That's a great point. Great point. Um, you know, one of the, the, things that appeals to um, I know a lot of passive investors is you know the fact that you you can get paid in in multiple ways you know just like you can with regular real estate and that you you get dividends um, uh, and then if the, when the property is sold um, you you know get a a sort of piece of that action um, and the equity side, uh, but you also get the tax advantages and some of the other things that. Uh, so you know, you may start off investing a hundred thousand, but by the time you're done, you know, you've you've turned that hundred thousand into two hundred thousand. Um, you know, just just through these various, you know, not only tax savings but the you know the the, the other ways you're being paid. Um, uh, you know, and and I think that that's one thing a lot of people don't know about. You know, I I think. Financial planners are out there saying, "Hey, you need to diversify. You need to, you know, invest in a lot of different types of investments. You know, all of them related to the market mostly. But um, then, then they, you know, they say, yeah, you've got to allow for inflation over time, so that you're not just drawing upon the same nest egg. And so, I, I, do, do you have, you know, maybe an example, you know, people that have you've been investors that are." I hate to use this term, a gambling term, but you know, letting it ride. That just, they just keep, you know, uh, you know, you know, taking everything that they've earned on that and just keep pumping it into to grow their nest egg. Well, that's a that's a common way of investing where people are taking their earnings and they're they're putting it back into real estate because you know it's where else are you going to put it? I mean, you you know, you're limited in what investment options are available out there. You know, you got the stock market, you got bonds, you got real estate, you know, there's a few other things that, that people invest in, but, um, you know, real estate has historically been the place where, you know, most millionaires are made, right. As they've, the old saying goes. And, 
uh, it's a hard asset and people, uh, people like to invest in it. And so we find frequently when we have exits from our, uh, syndications, people, you know, come right back and invest in the next fund. I mean, you're getting all the same benefits of real estate ownership when you invest in a syndication that you do when you own directly except one. So you'll get, uh, the cash flow, you'll get appreciation, you'll get depreciation tax benefits, you'll get amortization tax benefits. Uh, but the one thing you don't get is that 1031 exchange benefit. If you if you own properties individually, you can sell it and defer tax on that sale uh, if you exchange into another uh, property within set time periods. And, you know, while that uh, that benefit is nice. Uh, you do give that up when you're investing in a syndication. For the most part, maybe one percent of the time, there's situations where uh, the 1031 exchange option might be uh, available. But generally speaking, it's not. In my opinion, that's really not that big of a loss. I mean, as much as that's a great tax benefit, what I've found is most often when people are in a 1031 exchange, they make really bad acquisition decisions when they're on their up leg property because their back is against the wall uh, with timing and they have to make that purchase in a very narrow time window. And so people tend to overpay for real estate or buy the wrong property because they're letting the tax tail wag the investment dog. So not really the best idea, but you know, always recycling capital back into the real estate market does tend to make a lot of sense. Looking at the, you know, the current economy, I mean, we've got inflation and people are talking about major recession, maybe a correction, maybe a crash. How how do you sort of position your deals, you know, keeping the, the, those factors in, in mind? Well, I guess in part, you know, I saw this coming. So we've actually been massive sellers over the last uh, 18 months. We've sold dang near our entire portfolio, uh, you know, right at the peak of the market here. And we have seen prices retrench a little bit now that interest rates kicked up. Uh, so now we're going to start looking to buy again uh, at better prices than we could have bought, you know, even three months ago. So that's part of it is just being in tune to the market and trying to do the best you can to take advantage of cycle opportunities. You know, the other real, real defense, and this is one people miss out on a lot, and it's probably one of the biggest mistakes that people make when investing in passive syndications, I guess I neglected to list this one earlier when you asked this question, is how the property is being financed. And oftentimes, you know, one mistake people make investing in passive syndications is they're like, I'm gonna go for the one that has the highest projected return. And, and oftentimes the way they get that extraordinarily high projected return is by using tons and tons of leverage. Like they might be using a bridge loan that's at 90% of cost and financing the entire renovation, uh, you know, capital stack. And, you know, now your loan to value ratio is, is pretty high and you're really counting on appreciation and a continued perfect climate of low interest rates and everything else in, able, in, in order to uh, refinance out of that bridge loan. And I think we're gonna see people get backed up against a wall with that kind of financing here pretty soon. And, and they could end up in some cases losing it all, so to speak. And so, you know, I think the biggest defense in the face of uncertainty is just be conservatively financed. You know, don't be going for those high leverage, high return opportunities. Instead, look for sponsors that are conservatively financing, putting in a moderate to low level of debt and uh, have enough equity and safety and cash reserves to be able to weather a little bit of a storm. And then the market will do what the market does. And, and you just ride it out to the next market cycle peak. That's one defense. The other defense and you know, really important one is where you're investing. And I always say you got to invest in markets where people are moving to and avoid markets where people are moving from. And if you invest in markets where people are moving to, you're using demographic cycle to your advantage which will help mitigate economic cycle shifts. Hmm, that's a good good point. What about assets? Uh, you know, asset classes like um, uh, self storage, mobile homes. You know, so, some that might be geared a little bit better for uh, recessionary or inflationary times. 
Well, first, I would argue that they're not necessarily better uh, in recessionary times. People say like, oh, mobile home parks are great in a recession because, you know, these are, uh, you know, the uh, lowest tier of housing and there's always somebody that's going to live there and so on and so forth. But I mean, you know, you're also dealing with some of like in the pandemic, these are the first people to lose jobs, right? And so they're the first people that can't pay. And, you know, there's, there's reasons why. Uh, there are risks in every asset class. You know, even self-storage, people say like, oh, well, when people are getting forced out of their house, they're renting self-storage and, you know, but that's not necessarily always true. And it doesn't mean that they're gonna pay either. Uh, you can have defaults there as well. So I think it's what's most important is to just diversify. You know, each of these different asset classes has its advantages and disadvantages. And if you're invested across the entire spectrum, you can capture all those advantages and disadvantages, which may be working out of sync with each other at different times. And when one's doing good, maybe the other's doing okay and vice versa. Uh, so I, I think it just makes a lot of sense to add all of this stuff to your portfolio in some respect. Uh, are you in other aspects of commercial at all? Anything like you know triple net um, or uh, industrial, or, or um, are you pr you're primarily focused on the multifamily side? No, I just we do multifamily. It's I found that if I stay in my lane, I do a lot better. When I try to veer out of my lane, I usually get hit by a passing vehicle. So instead, <laughs> I just uh, I, I do what I do best. I've I've kind of got the been there done there hat. You know, I'm an old dog too, and I've been around a while, and I've. I've done all of those things. Well, I haven't done industrial or triple net, but I've done just about everything else, hospitality, uh, single family, multifamily, ground up construction, land development, uh, you know, self storage, built a self storage facility. I've kind of done all these different things and I've just found what I'm best at is what I'm doing right now, which is multifamily real estate. And that's, that's where we stay. Yeah, I think that's smart too. Just to, yeah, I mean that's an area you've been in for so many years that you you've got the track record and uh, the experience. Uh, um, just just a quick question um, here too on on the we talked a little bit about sort of the income opportunities associated with it, and uh, you address this in your book too. Um, you know, sort of the difference between cash flow distributions and income. And I thought you had a really good explanation for that. Yeah, the, the two are like second cousins. I mean, people think that income is cash flow, but it's not. I mean, you could have income and then the, you know, the sponsor can be retaining the income to put on a new roof. And, you know, you still had income, but no distribution. Uh, or you could have a situation where there's no income, but you have a distribution. Like, let's say there's a refinance and you pulled cash out. You know, you had a $10 million loan and you got a $12 million loan and there's $2 million left over. You can distribute that to the investors as a return of capital, uh, even though there's no income uh, that's realized. So people uh, have to disconnect the distributions they receive from the income that they're allocated up for tax purposes. They're just not the same thing. Do you think it's wrong for people to invest in syndications for cash flow? Well, it depends on what kind of syndication you're investing in. It's certainly wrong to invest in a ground up development for cash flow because you're not going to get any. <laughs> right, uh, but right. it's really common for people to invest in syndications for cash flow. We have a lot of retired investors who rely on the cash flow. Uh, the important piece to realize, though, is that typically in the early years of a syndication business model, uh, the cash flow isn't that great. And so, like, if you're buying a property and your objective, you know, the company's objective is to uh, renovate units or, you know, make unit interior upgrades and, you know, raise rents on, you know, new tenants as they move in. So let's say you're renting out apartments for $800, somebody moves out, you go in and renovate it, put in a couple thousand dollars worth of uh, improvements, you know, probably three to $10,000 worth of improvements, depending upon age and what it needs and whatnot. Uh, and then, you know, you re-rent that apartment for 1200, you know, it's a $400 rent pump. It's pretty significant, but if the quality is right, you know, somebody new coming in uh, will very likely be very happy with that and see that as a good value for them relative to other options in the marketplace. Ultimately, you're increasing the income of that property, but initially, 
uh, you haven't had a chance to do that yet. So what you'll typically find in most syndication plans is that in the first couple of years, cash flow is pretty light. It might be somewhere in the two to four percent range, uh, somewhere in there. Even though sponsors are promising you eight, forget about it. It's not happening uh, unless they're distributing cash that you know you gave them. It's not coming from income, that's for sure. So. Uh, you know, if you got to think of it uh, kind of on the longer term horizon, like where will cash flow ultimately be? Um, and, you know, if you're investing over time and you like the drip plan, right, where you're always kind of investing and doing new deals, uh, you'll have older ones that are doing more cash flow than newer ones and, you know, kind of blends together to give you a fair return. That's good. That's a good approach. I like that. Well, you, you know, your company sounds uh, like it has just been been doing great uh, what what excites you sort of about uh, your company in the future here well i i just look forward to the next phase of growth i mean you know we've always done really well when we're taking advantage of some kind of dislocation in the market and uh, you know i started out buying foreclosed real estate and you know when things weren't going so well we had some of our best years and right now we're seeing some, you know, a little bit of rockiness. There's, you know, interest rate stuff and, you know, some debt stuff and a lot of owners that are, uh, have been financing on some shaky uh, debt here in a not too distant past, which may present opportunities coming up. And I look forward to uh, seeing how that plays out and playing a role in helping to, you know, gather up some of that real estate. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, um, gosh, uh, you know, the there's like so many different questions I could ask right now. Yeah, you know, some of the areas uh, you talked a little bit about the income um, or the pref uh, preferred returns and you know, sort of cash flow issue. Uh, if companies list, for example, yeah, year one you're going to get you know eight percent, year two, you know, they just kind of when their presentations, you'll see the, you know the same number carried across. But like you said, it for it to actually happen isn't likely but do they make up for it in, in subsequent years or um, uh, it, or does it depend on the deal it all depends on the deal I mean oftentimes you know you'll see that these are put out with what's called an eight percent preferred return or some percentage of preferred return and what that means basically is that the investor gets a hundred percent of all cash flow that's distributed until such time that they've met that return hurdle and in most cases, it's a, cumula it's a, um, a cumulative return. Now, you got to read the words in the operating agreement to make sure that that's true because it isn't always. But the industry most common, the most common industry standard, there is such a thing, is for that return to be cumulative. So in other words, let's say in year one, you got a 4% return. Uh, you'd get 100% of it. And in year two, you get an 8% return, you'd get 100% of it. And in year three, it's a 12% return, you'd still get 100% of it because they still owe you 4% from year one. That's a simplistic example more than it's a real world example because generally it takes longer to ramp up than that. But ultimately the objective is to get you to that 8%. Now sometimes you don't get that 8% until the property sells and you'll get the first piece of cash flow until you get to that 8% before then it reverts to you know, kind of a split scenario where you know the spots are splitting in the profits with you. Gotcha, gotcha. Wow, well, uh, yeah, again, this, this is like a lot, of, a lot of questions I have, but um, we're, we're kind of running running uh, over the clock here, and I appreciate your, your hanging on here this long. Um, uh, we have a part right now, a segment we call uh, the Wrap It Up, and I ask you a series of sort of quick questions and on uh, resources that you've used and that have been of value to you so our listeners might uh, be able to find, about, find out about the good resources for themselves. So... If you're ready, we can go ahead and uh, wrap it up. Let's do it, Bill. All right. Favorite real estate book? Oh, wow. Favorite real estate book? I haven't read a real estate book in ages. Um, I guess probably the one I wrote maybe is my has to be my favorite one. But if that one doesn't count... Um, <laughs> we are going to list a link on that, by yeah, the way. Okay, that, yeah. sounds, that sounds good because <laughs> it has been a long time since I've read a real estate book. I think I probably had read them all at one point. Um, so... Uh, uh, gosh, you know, I don't know. No, nothing really comes to mind. It's been so darn long. I did read a, a there's a Deal Maker's Guide to Commercial Real Estate Investing. That was an interesting one. It's actually like a $500 uh, spiral bound book wow. uh, by Ray Alcorn. If you can find a copy of that, like on eBay or something, it's pretty darn informative. 
Oh, that's great. Okay, I'll list that. Uh, what about just a general business book that's uh, been valuable to you? Uh, I just read The One Thing. That was a pretty good book. I like um, that book a lot. Yeah, I, I just I actually just read that, you know, and it's been recommended to me for years, but I never have time to read books. But finally, I got to sit down and read that one. That one was pretty cool. Another one I liked was a book called TED Talks, and it was written by the guy that's the head of the TED Talk organization. It talks about, you know, public speaking and, you know, giving presentations and that sort of stuff. That one's pretty cool, too. Oh, that's great. How about a, a website that you use on a regular basis that's just integral of your, what you do in your business? Well, a multiple listing service would be one because <laughs> that's, that's a valuable resource, at least on the residential side. On the commercial side, um, you know, we, uh, I like CoStar and Axiometrics, which are two paid services that we, that we use uh, that give us a lot of really, really, really good data, but it's extraordinarily expensive not really all that useful for individual investors because it just costs too much. But, you know, just, uh, I like, I like Google, man. It's like, you can find anything you need. If you want to know, like, what are the top 10 cities for population growth? It'll take you right to the page on the Census Bureau's website that will give you the list. And, and if you try to go to the Census Bureau's website and find it, good freaking luck. <laughs> yeah, really. So, <laughs> so, uh, that one really is, is probably one of the best ones. Uh, you know, I, I also, uh, there's a couple reports I like. Uh, that you can get online for free. One of them is the Milken Institute's Best Performing Cities Index. Uh, you can just Google that. It'll take you right to the page. It's on the Milken Institute's uh, website. It comes out like getting every year, January, February. And it lists out the best uh, performing cities across the U.S. and why. So that's really good for that's making great. some decisions on you know where you might want to invest. And another one that's kind of like that is if you just Google the ULI and PWC uh, oh, emerging that's... trends in real estate. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, emerging trends in real estate. And if you just Google that, you'll find it. It's Urban Land Institute in cooperation with Price Waterhouse Cooper. Um, it's a really cool report that you know talks about different geographical markets and uh, you know free resource, good stuff. Excellent. How about a favorite app? Google Maps because I can see aerial images of neighborhoods and properties and do a street view to kind of like see a neighborhood all the way across the country, even when I'm sitting here in the wine country of California. That's great. Um, how about a favorite quote? Oh, man. Uh, good question. It's got to be Warren Buffett's. I think it was Warren Buffett's quote, right? That says to, uh, you know, be uh, fearful when others are greedy and be greedy right. when others are fearful. Right, right. Good one. And uh, this one, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, I don't know if you can answer it or not, but we'll see. It's uh, basically if you lost absolutely everything, all your assets, and all you had uh, was what you already know uh, and $1,000 in cash, what would you do to relaunch your real estate investing business? That's way more than I had when I started. I had no cash and <laughs> I had no knowledge. So having $1,000 in cash would be like a million bucks. Uh, compared to what, where I started and having the knowledge that I have right now, which they can't take away, well, I guess maybe amnesia could, there, there's no stopping me. Uh, you know, I, I know too much. I could get right back into this game in a heartbeat. That's great. That's great. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of folks listening to that uh, want to find out more about you and what you do and your company. Um, what's the best way for people to find that information? Best way is through our website. It's praxcap.com. It's P R A X C A P.com. It's our company, Praxis Capital. You can also find me on Instagram at investor Brian Burke. Uh, you can also find me on biggerpockets.com in the forums, just answering questions or I've written a few articles for their blog. You could check out and just uh, search for it on the author page uh, or the Bigger Pockets podcast. Uh, or just check out uh, the Hands Off Investor. That's basically a download of my entire brain. Uh, you can find that at biggerpockets.com forward slash syndication book. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. Well, Brian, this has been incredible, uh, great information. I mean, great information. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't usually push people's books on the air, but uh, I, I really, really love the book and I would really recommend it for anybody considering um, investing in uh, syndications and, and really, really, truly passive income. Um, but before we go, uh, there is a, uh, a tradition we have here where our guests close us out with their best uh, closing howl. 
So, uh, you know, uh, we're called the old dogs, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So are you you ready for this, Brian? I'm ready. Hit me up. All right. Go for it. All right. Uh... All right. That was good. That was good. It was kind of toned down a little bit, but uh, it was good. You always got to be under the radar, Bill. Yeah, I like that. I like that. (laughs) Well, Brian, thanks so much for coming on. It was just a, a, a great opportunity uh, for our guests, and uh, I really enjoyed the interview. It's just a, a good time. Yeah, it's a great time. Thanks for having me on, Bill. Appreciate it. You bet. And I also want to thank all our old dog listeners out there, too, uh, just for joining us. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot, and we really appreciate it. Now, please note, old dog listeners, everything presented here today uh, that uh, Brian spoke about can be accessed in detail. Also, links to the things he talked about in his book um, are in our show notes at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog, and look for the episode. Episode with uh, Brian Burke. Well, that's the show for today. Remember, cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.